and I'm going to share just a few things about him. For decades, Ken Anderson has and continues to direct stellar choirs, including the MLK Community Choir, USD, and UCSD Gospel Choirs, which perform locally throughout the country and internationally. He has also performed with the San Diego Symphony and San Diego Opera. Brother Anderson is a worshiper of Jesus, an ordained minister, college professor, and music instructor who has a passion for teaching the history of spirituals and gospel music. And he's very humble. So thank you so much for being here. Can I say all that? And didn't even talk about all those spirituals, but he is very humble. Thank you for being here. We're excited and we're ready to praise the Lord. Good morning. Morning, church. Good morning. Wow. 
I don't know whether to call you Dr. Anderson, Reverend Anderson, Ken, but God bless you. God bless Christ in your heart. I missed you guys last week. I was on holiday with my husband in Hawaii. We still like each other, thanks be to God. <laughs> I was telling Gina, you know, by the grace of God, we're, we uh, really love spending time together. We don't get to do that very often. So thank you for the privilege of being able to go away. Shall we join together in the call to worship? Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. who invites us to turn away from the influences of the world around us and confess him alone as Savior and Lord. Let us worship together. Please stand with me as we sing from hymn 543, Go Down Moses. to confess as a community, as a covenant people, let us remember why we need to do that. All, all fall short of the glory of God and need God's forgiveness and reconciling power. Let us join together and pray the prayer of confession as printed in the screens and in the bulletin. We give you praise and honor, loving God, and seek to know you, Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit. We place you in the highest place and worship you, for you alone are worthy of all honor. And so we confess to you the ways in which our lives do not honor you. We get distracted and pulled by so many competing things. Worries and frustrations abound in our world. In this sacred place, we name you again as Lord and bring to your holy altar all that troubles us, all that pulls our focus away from you, we confess and ask your forgiveness. Let us continue in silence. 
praying individually to our Lord. Amen. Hear now these words of forgiveness. People of the living God, I declare that God's mercy is wider than our sins. God's power far exceeds our limitations, and God's love wins out over all that rises against us. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. Good morning, Christ United. I'm going to be reading a few announcements. And whatever I don't read, just please check them out later on. We welcome Mr. Sean Doddleson, a faithful member of CUPC, to the pulpit this morning. August 3rd, CUPC's Youth Retreat, volunteers and youth who are rising kindergartens through rising ninth graders are welcome to participate. 
Detailed flyers and permission slips are in the Nortex. August 3rd, Jazz on the Plaza, 3 to 5 p.m. August 10th, Safety and Security Committee will be hosting a Safety and Security in Today's Church workshop on Saturday, August 10th at 10 a.m. in the GWS Fellowship Hall. Our own Sean Donaldson will be presenting our de-escalation and other important aspects of safety and security for the church and congregation. Everyone is welcome and, and encouraged to attend. We're especially recommending this for our ushers and deacons. RSVP by August 7th to Linda, and her information is here. August 24th, the Golden Years Ministry, GYM, Oldies But Goodies, Junior and Senior Prom. Don't miss it. It's going to be a fantastic event. My um, Walk With Me Bible Study group and I are inviting everyone to join us at the Rescue Mission on September 23rd for a succulent planning group. Um, Pastor's son has one of our creations in their house and it's, it looks really great. So if you're interested, there'll be more information. There's a, a website on the Rescue Mission's website where you would sign in and share important information. Roger will be reading the scripture. Good morning. First readings today come from Exodus chapter 13, verses 20 through 22, and Exodus 32, verses 1 through 5. Exodus 13. After leaving Sukkoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Exodus 32. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing, and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they had handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and, said, and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. Holy wisdom, holy word. Moses and the Bush by Andrea Skevington You stood on that dry mountain, eyes narrowed against the wind sand, scanning the bright horizon, looking for threat or grazing for those sheep. Were you content to be a shepherd now, Prince of Egypt? Were you reconciled to this life smaller than your dreams? Did you think it was all too late, too late to do anything? to help your brothers, to help your sisters, the slaves, to reclaim your people? Shepherd, with the bleating of the flock about you, did you dream still under the strong sun of what could or should have been? Did a new world seem impossible? Or were you breathing in this moment with the dust smell and the sheep smell and the plants thick with resin? It was no dream what happened next. No could or should have been that burning bush 
crackling smoke smell burning but not consumed. In that moment you took off your shoes and learned a name for God that is no name. I am what I am. I will be what I will be. In a moment, your reality peeled open, revealing fire within, the truth within, giving you back the discomfort of hope, giving you back your people and your way.
you. <laughs> the second reading is from Exodus uh, chapter 4, and it talks about God commissioning Moses to go down to uh, Egypt and free his people. Verse 4 starts, Moses answered, What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, What is in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, Throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake, and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and turned it back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, Put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand inside his cloak. And when he took it out, his skin was leprous. It had become white as snow. Now put your hand back into your cloak, he said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak. And when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. Then the Lord said, if they didn't believe you or pay attention to the first sign, they may believe the second. But if they, didn't, if they do not believe the two signs, I'll listen to you. Take some water from the Nile and pour it on the ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and of tongue. The Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, pardon your service, Lord. Please send someone else. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses and he said, what about your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way here to meet you, and he will be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand so that you can perform the signs with it. Holy wisdom, holy word. Today, some people uh, say what will help them in their unbelief is that they received a sign from God. Something that was irrefutable proof that not only that God exists, but that He is interested in their life. That they mattered enough to God for Him to show them a sign. But what if Almighty God answered their request and gave them a sign that was inexplainable and undeniable? How much would it really change their life? And if it did change them, for how long? We read in the Gospel of John, even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. In this particular place, the people had seen Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. What greater sign is that? Yet they all didn't believe. The blind received sight, the crippled walk. The secret healed. These miracles are signs of God's existence, power, and mercy. Yet some still doubt. And this doubt goes all the way back to the beginning. Things we hear of Moses and his commission to free the Israelites from Egyptian slavery. In the desert, while herding a flock, he saw a burning bush on a mountain that was not consumed by fire. He went up and heard God speaking from it. Yet when God told him that he was going to send him to free his people, Moses asked God to send someone else. God wasn't asking, of course it's God, so Moses was going to go. Moses went and he was given several signs to perform in front of the people so that they would believe his message that God was going to free them. One of the signs was turning that staff into a snake. It took ten plagues before Pharaoh released the Israelites from slavery, the last of which, as we heard earlier, killed all the firstborn in Egypt. The Israelites left captivity and journeyed until they came to the Red Sea, this giant body of water. Pharaoh sent his army after them, and in one of the greatest signs in the Bible, the Red Sea parted 
by the power of God and let the Israelites cross as if on dry land. When Pharaoh's chariots and soldiers tried, the sea closed around them, they were all destroyed. God sent a cloud to guide them by day and a pillar of fire to guide them by night. When they grew hungry, bread, or manna as they called it, it rained down from heaven. In the evening, quails came and covered the camp so they could eat them. When they grew thirsty, Moses struck a rock and water came out of it. When they reached Mount Sinai, Exodus chapter 19 says, Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like a fire, like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and the voice of God answered him. Eventually, Moses went up into the mountain to receive what we all know as the Ten Commandments. But Moses was gone for a while, and the people wondered what happened to him. Let's recap the signs that God showed them. Ten incredible plagues which led to their freedom. The sea parting to allow them to pass and closing to destroy the enemy sent after them. A pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. Food raining from down from heaven, and a rock that delivered water. Finally, God resting on a mountain in a billowing cloud, and the mountain itself trembled. The Israelites, having received all these miraculous signs from God, felt compelled to honor him by making a golden calf and worshiping it. Needless to say, God wasn't pleased with them. Most of them perished in the desert. In Numbers chapter 32, we read, because they have not followed me wholeheartedly, not one of those who were 20 years old or more when they came out of Egypt will see the land I promised an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not one except Caleb and Joshua, the son of Nun, for they followed the Lord wholeheartedly. The Lord's anger burned against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness 40 years until the whole generation of those who had done evil in his sight was gone. God doesn't play. This brings me to the point of this sermon. Do you really want a sign from God? <laughs> Throughout history, people have received incredible signs, but chose to ignore them and follow their own path. And they paid the price. Galatians chapter 7 warns, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. To me, and this is just me talking, it would be better to not be 100% sure than to receive an absolute sign from God and ignore it. Speaking of signs from God, air travel. Anyone here had one of those wonderful experiences when their flight was delayed or canceled? Uh-huh, I have. That happened to this group of four passengers who got stranded at the airport late one night. They were told their flight would be delayed to the next day, so they found an isolated place in the airport and settled into their chairs for the night. They passed the time by talking about different subjects. Ultimately, they decided to talk about that one forbidden topic, religion. One was a famous historical scholar and archaeologist in his 60s. He was well versed in the New Testament, but he was an atheist. He spent most of his time trying to prove that the Bible wasn't accurate. One of the two 20-year-old passengers was heading to Las Vegas. He was meeting his Marine teammates there who promised him he would find out what Vegas was truly famous for. I can't talk about that in church. The other worked in a hospital as an x-ray technician and was returning from a medical conference. The fourth was a foreign traveler who didn't speak but listen to their conversation. When asked about religion, the scholar went into lecture mode and tried to point out a hundred reasons why the Bible was wrong. To his surprise, the Marine was able to counter most of what the scholar said, telling him how much God had been involved in his life, how he had almost died on his last deployment, but God saved him from that landmine. The scholar rolled his eyes and told him it was luck. The x-ray technician said he believed but he wished there was some kind of definite proof. The scholar smiled and said, there isn't any. What if there was, the traveler asked. 
They all turned to him, thinking that he really, really wasn't paying attention to their conversation. What do you mean, the technician asked. The traveler said, what kind of sign from God would it take for you to believe? The technician laughed. He goes, something crazy, something impossible. If that happened, I would definitely believe. The traveler turned to the scholar. What about you? What kind of sign would convince a scholar like yourself to believe? He replied, it's all nonsense, but if it could, it would have to be something that could be scientifically proven. The traveler turned to the Marine, and you? I already believe, the Marine said proudly. I know, the traveler said. I meant, what would it take for you to repent? The traveler's words made the Marine nervous. I always try to do the right thing, he said. The traveler asked, what would make you try harder? Are you some kind of priest or something, the technician asked. I am not, the traveler said, but I have a question for each of you. What kind of sign would convince you to believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that God exists and that he's active in your life? If someone could tell me something about myself that nobody else knows, the technician said, then I would believe. The traveler said, like you have this female friend that you're trying to decide if you're going to go date again. The technician was stunned. And that party you're about to go to, he said to the Marine, is that the behavior of someone who's walking with God? The Marine looked down, partly ashamed. Do you know anything about me, the scholar asked. The traveler was silent. Of course you don't, he said because I don't put my business on social media. While you, we were talking, it's obvious you looked up all that stuff on your phone. There's an incredible amount of information about us on this thing. And he showed his phone. The traveler asked, does your phone have the history of everywhere you have been? I hope you all know that. All our phones do, the technician replied. It's a cool feature. He showed the traveler his screen showing a map and a date and time. See, I was in LA yesterday and it showed it on the map. Where does it say you are right now? They all looked down at their phones, even the scholar. We're at Dallas Airport, the Marine replied, looking at the GPS history on his phone. They all nodded in agreement. Can I ask one favor of all of you, the traveler asked. They looked up and said, yes. He said, for a moment, close your eyes. Is this some silly trick, the scholar asked. It is not silly, the traveler replied. Reluctantly, they all closed their eyes. A moment later, the traveler asked them to open them. Their eyes opened and widened in shock. Their mouths dropped open in disbelief. Still sitting in their chairs, they were on top of a high mountain. They looked up at the birds who flew overhead and a stream that flowed below them. They all shook their heads in wonder and shock, then looked at the traveler. Close your eyes, he said quickly. They did. When they opened them again, they were back in the airport. How did you do that, the technician asked. The traveler ignored his question and said, look at your location history. They all eagerly pulled out their phones and checked. It showed that for a few minutes, they had been on a mountaintop in Tennessee. The next entry showed them back at the airport. Is that scientific enough for you, the traveler asked the scholar. The scholar looked suspiciously at his phone, thinking something had been manipulated. At that point, the traveler raised his arms and in a loud voice said, repent and believe. And then he faded from their view. They all stood, staring at the chair the traveler had been in, astonished. Each one responded to this absolute sign from God in different ways. This is obviously an analogy. In the parable of the sower found in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus explains different people's reactions to receiving the word of God by using a parable that compares spreading the word of God to a sower who plants seeds in the field. The Marine canceled his trip to Las Vegas. He went into the bathroom in the airport, fell on his knees and asked God to strengthen and guide him on his true path. He later became a military chaplain 
spreading the good news of salvation through belief in Christ. The Gospel of Matthew says of him this, but the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. The technician avoided calling his female friend for weeks, constantly checking his phone's GPS to remind him of the sign that he had received from God. After three weeks, he finally gave in and called his friend. He planned a very romantic weekend with her, telling himself that he wasn't hurting anybody. I'm sure his wife would disagree. He falls into the category, the seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy, but since they have no root, they last only for a short time. The scholar returned to his university and met with several of his colleagues. They were all amazed by the story he told them, which he backed up with GPS data. One, who was convinced the scholar saw a sign from God, asked him, what did you think when you were sitting on that mountaintop, when you saw all the, the birds flying and the river flowing? The scholar thought for a long moment, then smiled and said, best trick I've ever seen. That guy should have an act in Vegas. They all laughed. Matthew says of him this, when anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. Nothing anyone could say or do would change his mind. For those of us who believe, we know that God is active in our lives. And he gets, the closer we get to him, the more his signs to us become visible. Do you really want a sign from God? I would say, you've already received many signs from God. It's what our friends call, I should say it's what our atheist friends call luck, a coincidence. It's what I call a blessing from God. Don't let your sign from God last 15 minutes, but like our marine friend, make it a lifetime. We all see things that God has done for us in our lives. God has stepped in when we've had the worst things in our life happening, and he saved us. That's the sign we need from God, not a person appearing or disappearing. The closer you get to God, the more you read the Bible, the more you pray, and I hope it's every day, the more you'll see that he's walking with you, and in many cases, he's carrying you. Finally, when I think of what God is to me, it's simple. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me lie down beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me to pass of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you.
Thank you, Sean, for bringing that powerful word of God, and Ken for coming and gracing us with your, with your gifts and talents that you use to glorify God. Let us turn our hearts in prayer. I will lead us in a pastoral prayer, and then we will finish by saying the Lord's Prayer together. Let us pray. Lord our God, we come into your presence pleading with you to bring the world what it needs so that people may be freed from all their pain and enabled to serve you. Let the power of Jesus Christ be revealed in our time, for he has taken on our sin that justice might arise on earth, that all might have life and might see your salvation. Let your power be revealed in the world and let your will be done, your name be kept holy, and all wrongs be righted in this turbulent and difficult age. We lift our prayers of grief, our lament for Sonia Massey, her family, her community. We lift our prayers for understanding, accounting for wrongdoing and for healing. In the wake of her death, we say and pray her name. Sonia Massey is yours, God, called and claimed redeemed by your grace and glory. O oh Lord our God, you alone can help. You alone are the savior of all peoples. In your great mercy, you can bring peace. We look to you. And when we consider your word, we remember the mighty promises you have given, promises which are to be fulfilled in our time. With confidence, we ask your healing hand for those who are sick and those homebound. We silently lift up those who are listed in our bulletin in need of your healing touch. Hear us, Lord, as we lift those, the prayers we have silently to you. Father God, maker of heaven and earth, 
You created this world to be your world. Restore peace where strife prevails. Where there is war, we pray peace and justice, justice for Ukraine, for Sudan. We pray for Israel and Gaza. We pray, Lord, against the political wars whose rhetoric is to pummel those who they oppose and preen their own egos. Forgive our vicious words or our divisiveness. Let us look not to material things to save us or to whom we put value, but to you alone, Christ Jesus, who has shown us the way of salvation and abundant life. We ask that you would keep our hearts filled with your Holy Spirit and guided by patience, faith, love, and assurance of your plans for our future and hope in Christ. We pray these things with the prayer he taught us, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite the ushers to come forward at this time to receive our tithes and offerings. And as they are coming, brothers and sisters, let us gather our resources not to create an idol to distract us from trusting God, but to give so others might know and live the full grace of life in Christ Jesus. Please give as the Lord encourages you. Ushers, if you would please come forward at this time. the giver of every good gift except these offerings we pray that through them we may do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with you our sovereign and our God amen, amen. 
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Amen. Amen.